Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Mouse and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be yet another solved case for my Curious Case series. But before we delve into this video, I would just like to say that I actually have a second channel, which is where I'll be posting more behind the scenes style content and videos that won't fit on this channel, so more like conspiracy kind of videos maybe I don't know it's just kind of where I'm going to upload whatever I want to regardless of what the content is so if you're interested in checking that out there's a link to that in the description box down below and I'll also leave a link in the iCards you'll also notice that now there is a blue join button next to the subscribe button if you're on the computer and that is so you can become a channel member which means you get access to videos one day early for as little as $1.99 a month I close my patreon and move to channel memberships just to make life a lot easier for everyone including me if you want to support this channel then feel free to do so but don't feel obliged to obviously there are actually three different tiers so click that blue join button to find out more information i just like to point out this video has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that it's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet any theories discussed in this video are just that theories they are not fact they shouldn't be taken as such and any theories and opinions expressed in this video do not necessarily necessarily do not represent the views of myself law enforcement or anybody else involved in this case unless otherwise stated I've missed saying that I've actually taken uh, I think it's been two weeks now since I last uploaded I've taken a small break for mental health and I'm so happy to be back and bring you more cases and with that being said let's delve right into this case <laughs> Tuesday the 7th of February 2017 would be a rather peaceful and uneventful day for the people of Antwerp, Belgium. Or so they thought. In the subsequent weeks, months and years that followed, the residents of Antwerp would learn of how a young, hopeful woman met her gruesome end within the town that they believed to be safe. And that woman was 20-year-old Shashia Maru. Shashia actually lived in Heist op Denberg, I believe it's pronounced, which was about a 30-minute train journey from Antwerp. Now a lot of sources in this case are in Dutch and are quite vague and the translations are pretty difficult. Obviously I'm not a native Dutch speaker, so, finding out information about Shashia's childhood was relatively difficult. I don't believe there was much information publicly available anyway, even in Danish, not Danish, even in Dutch. So, there is not that much that I know about Shashia's early years. I don't even know her birthday, I just know that she was 20 years old. If you can speak Dutch, then feel free to see if you can find out some more details about Shashia, so that I can leave them in the pinned comment down below. Because I think it's really important to know who the victim was and their life story I think that's really really vital to a case such as this But what we do know about Shashia is that from childhood she was obsessed with Pokemon According to wikipedia.org, Pokemon, which is known as Pocket Monsters in Japan Is a media franchise managed by the Pokemon Company the franchise began as a pair of video games before an anime was released and has since evolved into a massive global franchise that has grossed $90 billion in revenue. The universe of Pokemon features a bunch of different creatures that the players use to battle other people in the game. These creatures are usually quite cute and due to this they are very, very popular. You might have heard of Pikachu, which is probably one of the most famous and recognizable Pokemon. The franchise had a whole heap of different products that you could buy, such as Pokemon cards, the video games, the animes, the books, but one particular aspect of that were the Pokemon figurines. And it was these figurines that a lot of people collected, with some of the rarer figurines going up for sale on sites such as eBay, just from a quick browse, um, for 
almost 500 pounds. Shashia had collected these figurines from childhood and her collection was quite extensive. Now, Shashia didn't just collect these Pokemon figurines, she also attended numerous conventions. And it was at these conventions that people cosplayed as their favorite fictional characters. If you don't know what cosplaying is, it's where you effectively dress up as your favorite fictional character, such as a Pikachu or a anime character or Harry Potter. Shashia attended these conventions dressed as her favorite Pokemon and on all accounts, she always had a really fun time. But Shashia didn't just go to these conventions just for the fun of dressing up and meeting other people. She also went with the intention of trading. She wanted to trade her figurines to try and complete her collection. After all, the slogan for the Pokemon franchise is gotta catch them all, which means that the people who are obsessed with the franchise want to collect all of the figurines, all the Pokemon cards, and that kind of thing. Shashia wanted to extend her already massive collection. As I said earlier, we don't know that much about Shashia's childhood besides the fact that she loved Pokemon, but what we do know is after she graduated from school, high school I believe, she went on to work at an indoor playground, which I believe was actually a nursery, but the translation just came out as an indoor playground. And that nursery was in her hometown, and she used the money that she earned from working at the nursery to purchase more figurines, more Pokemon collectibles. She was described by her colleagues and her friends and her family as being a very sweet girl, but somewhat introverted. She was also described as being able to see the good in almost anybody, a quality that would sadly be exploited by a man who would hide his true intentions behind a similar Pokemon obsession. Quite frequently, Shashia was unable to find the figurines that she wanted in her collection, the more rare figurines, at these trade fairs and conventions, so she turned to the global marketplace the internet. Shashia joined a Facebook group that was dedicated to Pokemon figurines and Pokemon card trading, and it was in this group and through this group that she met a 25-year-old man called Johnny Van Den Broek. They exchanged several messages through Facebook Messenger, and it was over the course of these messages that Shashia realized that Johnny had a figurine that she desperately wanted. So the pair decided that they would meet up and have a trade. The indoor playground where Shashia worked at, which as I said, I believe to be some kind of nursery of sorts, was closed on Tuesdays. So that seemed to Shashia the perfect day to go and trade with this man, Johnny. Shashia left her home on the 7th of February, 2017, and unknowingly, this would be the last time she'd be seen alive by her family. The CCTV at her house captures her leaving the front door in a yellow coat at 8.57 a.m. She headed towards the local train station where she was captured on CCTV again, boarding a train to Antwerp Central Station. Now the CCTV at the Antwerp Central Station then depicted her leaving the station on foot at 10.41 a.m. She would never be seen on CCTV ever again after this point. Johnny only lived a couple hundred meters away from the Antwerp Central Station, so it would seem a bit ridiculous for Shashia to have hailed a taxi to go the short distance and a bit of a waste of money, so it wouldn't have been out of the ordinary for Shashia to have walked this distance. After all, she was a healthy, young girl. However, Shashia never arrived at Johnny's house. Johnny was actually waiting for Shashia at Antwerp Central Station, and fearing that he had been stood up by her, he sent her a Facebook message. And he sent this message at 11.02 a.m. asking where she was, followed by another message at 11.14 a.m. asking the same question, telling her that he was a bit worried. Though not long after Johnny had sent these messages, Shashia sent him a message saying that she decided to not show up. Now, according to some sources, Shashir had also planned to meet up with one of her friends after this trade had taken place. After all, the trade would only have taken maybe an hour max, maybe even half an hour. So it wasn't set to be like a long event. And this friend was waiting for Shashir at the train station as well. And they were set to meet in the afternoon, 
but she failed to show up to this meeting too. Her friend sent a worried Facebook message to Shashia and she actually responded. She responded at 2.28 p.m. saying that she decided to not show up just like with Johnny. Now, Shashia had left her computer at home, which I believe she shared with her family. When her family sat down to use the computer that afternoon, they noticed the worried messages that Shashia had received on Facebook and decided to call her and check up on her and see where she was and make sure everything was okay. After all, it was very out of the ordinary for Shashia to not have told her family that she had changed her plans uh, or kept them informed or anything like that. So it seemed very strange to her family. However, when her family called her, Shashia's phone went straight to voicemail. And when Shashia didn't come home for dinner that Tuesday evening, her family immediately contacted the authorities and reported her as missing. They feared the worst. The police were quick to go to Johnny's house to ask him some questions concerning the disappearance of Shashia, but he told them that he had not seen her and that she had failed to show up at the station as agreed. Investigators then began to start tracing Shashia's footsteps on the day she went missing, and they interviewed her family and friends to try and get any information concerning her disappearance. Two days after Shashia had gone missing on the 9th of February 2017, the missing persons unit was assigned to the case, which allowed the allocation of further resources in the search efforts. The police made a public statement that Thursday morning saying that they were investigating a very worrying disappearance. Investigators began to use CCTV to try and trace Shashia's footsteps on that Tuesday that she went missing. They traced her leaving her house, then arriving at her local train station, and then arriving at the Antwerp Central train station. However, this is where things began to get rather interesting. The CCTV at Antwerp Central Station depicted Shashia alighting the train carriage and meeting with a man who she left the station with. They left the station on foot, headed in the direction of Johnny's house. This, as you can imagine, was beyond suspicious to the investigators. At around 4.30 p.m. that same Thursday, the police obtained a search warrant, and using it, they entered Johnny's house. At the same time, they also brought Johnny in for questioning, and during this questioning, he actually made quite a number of contradictions, which further added to the investigators' suspicions that he may be involved or know something about her disappearance. When Johnny was initially arrested, the investigators noted that he had sustained an injury to his hand. They questioned him as to how he had sustained such an injury. However, Johnny refused to give a solid answer or a he just kind of beat around the bush and didn't really give a concrete, this is how it happened answer. The CCTV footage, which showed a man matching the description of Johnny, matching the same height, um, and these contradictions were enough for the police to actually arrest Johnny on suspicion of kidnapping. However, they didn't actually have any concrete evidence at all to say that Johnny was directly involved. There's no concrete evidence that could lead to a prosecution at this point, which is why the search warrant and the search of Johnny's premises was so vital so they could find some concrete evidence. The police hoped that they would find some kind of trace of blood or one of Shashir's possessions, which could lead to the uh, whereabouts of Shashir so that they could find her and bring her home, or so they could find some kind of closure for Shashir's family. Sadly, after six hours of searching the property at 10.30 p.m., investigators discovered a body buried in a shallow grave in the courtyard of the building where Johnny lived. Medical examiners were quickly called in, and shortly before midnight, that same Thursday, the body was confirmed to be that of missing 20-year-old Shashia. Johnny was subsequently rearrested on charges of murder. Johnny was interrogated, but he claimed that he had absolutely no recollection of that Tuesday. 
he had no memory of what happened at all. Upon checking the CCTV surveillance footage for the surrounding areas, the investigators discovered that at 2.47 p.m., Johnny actually arrived at a market in the town center where he briefly spoke with a friend. I'm not sure whether this friend was just shopping at the market or whether this friend was an employee. That information isn't super relevant to this case, but it does place him at the market. Interesting to note, Johnny, on this CCTV was actually wearing a different sweater to the sweater he was wearing uh, in the CCTV footage from the Antwerp train station where he had picked up Shashir. Johnny then bought a shovel from the market. Now this market, I'm not sure whether it was a supermarket like a Target or a Tesco kind of store or whether it was a market in a conventional sense. Again, that's lost in translation for me. Afterwards, Johnny returned to his home before leaving for work. He left an hour later at 3.54 p.m. and he was seen on CCTV boarding a tram headed towards his place of work, a McDonald's in Burks. These CCTV images show that Johnny was actually holding a cloth or rag against his hand. And when Johnny arrived at his workplace, he used the first aid kit to patch up the injury on his hand. How that injury came about, however, Johnny downright refused to tell the investigators. In fact, Johnny claimed to not have remembered what had happened for two and a half years after the fact. And it took two and a half years for this case to come to trial on the 18th of October, 2019, early this year. It was on the first day of this trial that Johnny actually broke his silence and broke his amnesia and told the court what happened that Tuesday. It was also during this trial that the text message exchanges between Shashia and Johnny were revealed by the prosecution to the court. Now, Shashia had in fact actually been slightly delayed in her train journey to Antwerp train station. And she had sent Johnny a simple text, just a courtesy to let him know that she's running just a little bit late. But in response, Johnny re replied by saying that she would be punished. The text from Johnny to Shashir had a underlying sexual nature, but Shashir was not interested at all, and she didn't hesitate to let Johnny know that she wasn't interested in anything sexual, she just wanted to trade Pokemon figurines. They had then met up at Antwerp Central Station as they had agreed, um, and as the CCTV images show. They made their way to Johnny's apartment and as arranged, Shashir then browsed Johnny's collection of Pokemon figurines, which he kept inside a glass display cabinet. As Shashir was browsing the display cabinet, Johnny actually grabbed her bum, which caused her to turn around in shock. Johnny then, despite Shashir texting him, telling him that she wasn't interested in anything sexual, began to kiss her. And according to Johnny, Shashir kissed back and they actually made their way to the bedroom. The couple then engaged in sexual intercourse and it started out quite tame and regular according to Johnny before it began to get a lot more rough. At one point, according to some sources, it was so rough that Shashir actually injured her back against the bed frame and they had to take a few moments for her to recover before they kept going. That was when Johnny decided to start choking Shashir in a sexual manner. He he kept choking her harder and harder, according to Johnny, before he realized that she was no longer breathing. Johnny then went on to tell the courts that he thought it would be too late to call emergency services and that nobody would believe him that it was an accident. So he decided that he would get rid of the body. Strangely, Johnny almost immediately started putting in place an alibi for what had happened. He started putting it out there. He sent messages from his Facebook account to Shashir just 21 minutes after the pair had met up at the train station. Those messages were setting up the alibi that Shashir hadn't turned up. Johnny then used Shashir's phone and social media accounts to further concrete his alibi by sending messages to himself from the phone saying that she wasn't going to come and then sending a message to her friend from her phone saying that she wasn't going to that either. He was behind all of the messages sent, all in an effort to conceal and protect himself and hide what he had actually done. Hiding what he had, in his view, 
accidentally done. Johnny then went to purchase a shovel from the local market, which he used to then dig the shallow grave in the courtyard. He then tied up Shashir's legs and arms and put her into the grave and buried her. The results of the searches that had been carried out by forensics and the investigators on Johnny's property were also something that were discussed at trial and had some pretty damning evidence. They also discussed the transcripts of the interrogations with Johnny. The results revealed that there had been some blood stains on Johnny's mattress which had been scrubbed in an attempt to conceal the bloodstains and get get the bloodstains out of the mattress. A tuft of Tashir's hair was also found between the fitted sheet and the mattress on Johnny's bed. When investigators confronted Johnny about the bloodstains on his mattress, he simply replied by saying, oh no, it seems as if I've done something, if I'm hearing this correctly. Johnny's claims of this amnesia hindered the investigation, and as I said, it was up until the first day of trial that Johnny actually revealed that he did know and did allegedly remember what happened that day. A number of female witnesses took to the stand during the trial and told the court of how Johnny had asked them to come over to look at his Pokemon collection. Another female witness claims that Johnny had asked her to engage in sexual acts with him in exchange for 500 euros. All of the witnesses had received messages via Facebook inviting them to come to Johnny's home. Now in the courtroom, Johnny used a doll to demonstrate to the jury how he had accidentally choked Shashir. He told the court that he didn't get the impression at any point that Shashir was in distress or was actually suffocating and that he had his eyes closed the entire time. As a result of this demonstration, a member of the jury actually fell ill and the trial had to be suspended the next day. Interestingly, the medical examiner actually supported the claim that Shashir had succumbed to strangulation. However, the same medical examiner was unable to determine whether the strangulation had been caused by hands or whether it had been caused by some kind of an object. Johnny's ex-girlfriend also took to the stand and told the court of how Johnny owned a special BDSM collar which they often used during sex. Now, interestingly, this BDSM collar could not not be found during any of the police's searches of Johnny's property. Its existence does heavily rely on this singular witness testimony from Johnny's ex-girlfriend. Some people believe that Johnny had used this collar to strangle Shashir before he then discarded of the collar in the same fashion that he discarded of Shashir's remains. The medical examiner also told the court of how Shashir had sustained an injury that could be indicative of forced intercourse. Shashir had sustained a bruising to her legs, which could show that her legs were forced open um, so that unconsensual sex could take place. However, the cause of this injury couldn't be 100% confirmed to have been caused by that, so it wouldn't really hold up too well in court. But I thought it was still interesting to point out. Johnny was ordered to undergo a psychological evaluation during the trial. And as a result of this evaluation, Johnny was diagnosed with a narcissistic and psychopathic personality disorder. It was determined that he had a sadistic pleasure in seeing other people suffer a pleasure which he explored through the use of sex. Johnny was described by the medical examiner as the kind of person who was quick to shift the blame. He was insensitive to stress and had an egocentric attitude. As a result of Johnny's sudden confession to the court that he knew what happened on the day that Shashia was murdered and went missing, the prosecution ordered that he undergo a second interrogation. However, one of Johnny's lawyers were unable to attend this interrogation, so it didn't go ahead, and for some reason, a second interrogation never actually came about. This proved not to be a massive issue for the prosecution because there was an overwhelming amount of evidence against Johnny in this case. Just one week after the trial commenced, on the 25th of October, 2019, a verdict was reached in this case. Johnny Van Den Broek, who was now 28 years old, was sentenced to life in prison. The court ruled his goal was to experience his ultimate sexual fantasy, extreme sex, until death followed. 
The jury actually dismissed Johnny's story as being completely unbelievable. The jury didn't believe that Shashir would have willingly and consensually agreed to engage in intercourse with Johnny, and the jury believed that that was rape, that it was forced. Johnny was also sentenced to an additional penalty of 15 years of judicial surveillance after his prison sentence had been completed. I've mentioned this before in my Mark de True series, which was about a case that also took place in Belgium, that a life sentence in Belgium is only between 15 to 23 years depending on previous convictions. After that 15 to 23 years has been served, the prisoner is then eligible for parole and is, their case is reviewed by the parole board. The parole board can deny parole an unlimited amount of times but after each time it's denied the prisoner can then appeal and apply for parole every year that follows. According to puresight.com, one in five US teenagers say that they have received an unwanted sexual solicitation via the internet. And shockingly, in 100% of these online cases, teens that are victims of online sexual predators have gone willingly to meet with them. 16% of teens consider meeting someone they've only talked to online, and 8% have actually followed through and met up with them. 33% of teens are Facebook friends of people they have not met with in person. The importance of internet safety is something that can't be stressed more, particularly today. Despite Shashia being a young adult, she still fell victim to a horrific crime by a internet sexual predator. Now in no way am I saying that it's Shashia's fault at all that this happened to her. I just think it's super important that we all take steps um, and preventative measures to make sure that we and our family and our friends are all safe when using the internet. It's important to stress these preventative measures, especially to teenagers and young adults such as myself. It's a sad fact of life that there will always be predators. There will always be people preying on vulnerable people online and in person. If you or anybody you know has been affected by any of the topics discussed in this video, you can find a link in the description box down below to a bunch of organizations and charities that you can contact if you want to find further information or to get, receive any support. Now, shockingly, this isn't the first murder case that has been linked to the Pokemon franchise. In 2016, the Pokemon company launched a mobile game called Pokemon Go, which accumulated more than 500 million downloads by the end of 2016. Pokemon Go is an augmented reality game that requires its players to venture out into the real world, and using its GPS, the players are able to then catch Pokemon out and about. The aim is to catch all the Pokemon, collect them all, you know, just like these Pokemon figurines, but it's just digital. It is a widely popular game, and sadly, it has also been linked to deaths and injuries. There even exists a website dedicated to tracking deaths and injuries that are directly linked to the mobile game, which is called PokemonGoDeathTracker.com. This website shows that there has been 19 deaths and 60 injuries relating to the app as of today, as of the day that I'm filming this. It lists events such as an 18 year old Pokemon Go player breaking into a house in 2016 to catch a Pokemon but was sadly fatally shot. Also in 2016, a woman disappeared while playing Pokemon Go and was sadly later found dead. In 2017, a man was killed by a security guard while playing the game. The list sadly goes on. I've left a link to this website in my citations if you wish to conduct your own further research into these Pokemon Go related cases. The most recent death connected to Pokemon actually occurred earlier this year in October. And this happened on the 21st of October 2019 when a Pokemon Go addict was shot and killed after witnessing a robbery while she was playing the game. Shashia's case wasn't the first case of an internet arranged trade or transaction resulting in a crime. Craigslist is seemingly a breeding ground for stranger on stranger attacks, robberies and murders. According to the Washington Post, Craigslist allows users to operate in almost complete anonymity and allows you to post ads to trade, sell and buy with strangers online. This allowed criminals to use the almost anonymous platform to prey on vulnerable people. Most notably, serial killer Philip Markov, who was dubbed the Craigslist killer, 
used the platform to rob three women. He actually killed one of them too, after meeting them on the website. According to the same article in the Washington Post, in 2013, a 53-year-old man called Richard Beasley used the platform to lure three men into Ohio woods under the false pretense of job listings. After which, Richard, along with the help of another teenage boy, murdered all three of the men. There are actually over 100 known criminal connections directly linked to Craigslist. And as a result of these criminal cases, a lot of cities and police stations have actually devised programs to ensure safety. A lot of cities actually created campaigns to ensure safe trading spots, either at a local police station or somewhere where it's heavily CCTV'd. And that was all in an effort to help people be more protected. This kind of criminal online predator isn't limited to just Craigslist. There are countless crimes connected to platforms such as Facebook, Facebook Marketplace, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, eBay, and so many more. As I said earlier, internet safety is as important as ever. Thankfully, in this case, the predator in question is behind bars. Hopefully, for the rest of his life. But who knows whether that guy or girl who likes your tweets or sends you a friend request or always comments on your Instagram posts really has sinister intentions. Thank you so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case series. Don't forget to follow me over on Instagram and on Twitter if you wanna see more of what goes on behind the scenes. Thank you so much to everyone for 50,000 subscribers on this channel. That is absolutely insane. My goal at the start of the year was to achieve 10,000 subscribers by the time the year was out. And obviously we have far surpassed that. And I just can't believe that so many people enjoy the content that I create and find it interesting. I don't really have the words to properly express just how thankful and grateful I am to you. But thank you so much for watching my channel and supporting all my videos. Thank you to every single person who watches my content. My new end of year goal is now 60,000 subscribers. So let's see if we can make that a reality. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you want to see more true crime content and more true crime cases just like this one and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post a brand new true crime video. As I said earlier, there's now that wee blue join button where you can join the channel members for as little as $1.99 a month, which will give you access to videos one day early. I've actually closed my official Patreon, so thank you so much to everybody who has supported me over on Patreon for the past year. It has helped me so much in creating videos, and I can't express enough my appreciation. Just as a forewarning, my next video will be sponsored. I know I've posted quite a few sponsored videos, I think three over the past couple months, but the next sponsored video will likely be the last sponsored video for the year. Thank you again for supporting me and putting up with these sponsored videos. I really, really appreciate that too. I saw some comments on my last sponsored video saying that you guys wanted me to go into much more depth in those kinds of videos. So I'm going to go as deep as I possibly can in the next video. So look out for that. It should be coming next week. When this video goes live, I will actually be at a YouTube convention called Social in the City Winter Edition which is where I've got two meet and greets with Eleanor Neal, George and Mary and Caitlin Rose. I also have a true crime panel with those same people and then a, another panel called Finding Your Niche. I attended the summer edition of this convention earlier this year where I also did a true crime panel with Eleanor Neal, George and Mary and Caitlin Rose uh, and you can find the vlog that I did of that entire experience on my second channel uh, and you can find my second channel in the iCard or link down below. So be sure to go check that out. I'm super looking forward to this entire weekend and I'll be posting what I've been up to over on my Instagram and on my Twitter so be sure to go follow me over there if you want to do that and I'm going to now stop plugging so many things to you and stop telling you so much. Um, I hope everyone is having a wonderful weekend. I hope everyone who celebrates Thanksgiving had a really good Thanksgiving. It's December 1st when this video goes up so happy happy Christmas or happy holidays or happy Yule or blessed be to anyone and everyone. Just yeah, I don't really know what I was going on. And with all that being said, I will see you in the next case. Oh,